Thank you, Per. It's uh, good to be here. I'm glad to see that the room is large enough for the number of interested people. Uh, but this is real life. If you talk about advocacy, if you talk about the need uh, to do better and to go beyond the routine, then you only attract a limited number of people. Yesterday, we had a session of the need for combining research and clinical work, and there were even less people. So just to tell, um, Unfortunately, most colleagues just want to do surgery, just deliver a good technique, try to make the patient happy, and if that's not the case, that's the end of the story. Without realizing there is the need for research, there is the need for improved health care, and there is also the need for advocacy, and that is what I will be talking to you about briefly, because we would allow to, to have some questions uh, and some interactions uh, with you. Mm. I do not think my clicker is working. Oh, okay. So, why do we need advocacy? And secondly, who are the targets of our advocacy? Well, all specialties that consider themselves as serious specialties perform advocacy at political level because they want to create awareness about the burden of disease, the impact of disease, and also the impact of disease on society and also on an individual. They want to show that the quality of life is severely impaired and that there is the need to do better than the current practice. And if you look at the four major diseases that are commonly recognized as important for mankind by WHO, you have cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, and then chronic respiratory diseases. The last uh, uh, group of diseases, the chronic respiratory diseases, are affecting the majority of the population, up to 30% of the total population, and occur uh, across the life cycle. In cardiovascular, diabetes, and cancer disease, as well as in neurologic diseases, there is a significant degree of lobbying, advocacy for the burden of disease and the need for better treatment, and they have huge opportunities for grant applications, and they are taken seriously by the health policy makers. Whereas this is not so much the case for patients affected with chronic respiratory diseases. The European Respiratory Society has been very um, successful in making uh, health policy makers aware of the burden of asthma and chronic bronchitis, but in the upper airways there is a lack of advocacy for one-third of the total patient population that is suffering from rhinitis, rhinosinusitis, and we as scientific community need to bring to the attention of the health policy maker that proper treatment of rhinitis and sinusitis is key to prevent the progression to asthma and bronchitis. Having said that, uh, you heard maybe this morning during the plenary that Euphoria was created as a non-profit organization in 2015, bringing different stakeholders together, uh, all dealing with uh, respiratory diseases, meaning ENT doctors, pulmonologists, allergologists, pediatricians, primary care physicians, pharmacists, and basic researchers, because it's only by joining forces in a multi-stakeholder alliance uh, that uh, achievements can be made on a sustainable way. Euphoria is having four pillars, research, education, and I will mainly highlight the advocacy that is currently being performed on an annual basis in order to bring to the attention of the politicians the need for advocacy and the need to implement novel treatment options into our daily practice. We utilize a patient-centered approach, and as I mentioned uh, just in previous slide, advocacy aims at bringing to the attention chronic respiratory diseases at political level as well as at patient level. Because if you are a patient affected by chronic, chronic rhinosinusitis, for instance, you have limited uh, information available online, there is no uh, trustable source of information, and you do not find testimonials of patients suffering from chronic rhinosinusitis. And we try to fill that gap. On an annual basis, we try to uh, engage different stakeholders in the advocacy that we apply at European policy maker level. This was the first one in 2015 on precision medicine in allergy and airways disease. 
the European Rhinologic Society, EAC, the European Respiratory Society, the patient organizations, all relevant stakeholders are involved and we try to reach the highest level of support, which is the Commissioner of Health of Europe, who can then disseminate his strategy and also support specific topics for research and grants uh, through these um, awareness campaigns that we have. As mentioned, uh, these activities can only be successful if you join forces with different stakeholders because the European policymakers, they don't like to see the different academies coming to knock on their door. They want to join uh, action plan, they want to join platform and one body to speak to. Uh, we define there the need to time to act. Um, and this is another campaign that was run by European Academy of Allergy Clinical Immunology doing skin prick testing on the members of the European Parliament. And you see Benoit here. Benoit was also skin prick testing actively with the other members of our, of our team, where we skin prick tested about 400 uh, members of the European Parliament and collaborators, showing that also amongst their community, the skin pick test positivity was found in 40% of uh, the members, raising awareness about the burden of this highly prevalent non-communicable disease. Following up on that, we try to progress slowly by not only bringing to the attention the need for better treatment, a high prevalence, but also implementing novel strategies for prevention and self-management of chronic respiratory diseases. And this was just uh, part of the program of an event in the European Parliament last year. And we just finished the European Summit in the Parliament in Vilnius with active participation of the Commissioner of Health, who happens to be a cardiac surgeon who is very supportive of initiatives in the field of chronic respiratory diseases and is actually supporting prevention, promotion and protection. Yeah. Three excellent words, three P's, which shows that we have a lot of instruments following those three P's and working on it. But Participation is the first P, participation. And participation uh, allow us to, to invite all actors and especially people using IT technologies, using mobile uh, applications, using M health capacities to monitor their own situation, to monitor environment to signal to responsible authorities and to be involved in such participatory uh, platform. They are doing brilliant job, especially Peter Herring. We know each other uh, four years and you know, I am so happy that we have such advanced advocates and leaders at European Union scene, at scene at, uh, at globally. And only uh, uh, such an uh, uh, opportunity to, to send big thanks to Peter Healings, to Professor Biscay, to all uh, experts who are very dedicated in, in, in implementation of uh, obligations. This is about climate change, it's about air pollution. Without uh, those actors, we have no chance to act directly. And for the European Union, uh, we have only one instrument to work together in, uh, on multilateral based coordinating our approaches, harmonizing our programs and presenting our um, uh, uh, action plans and of course building roadmaps, how can we improve step by step, year by year, uh, addressing those challenges. So just to tell, he is the one promoting very much uh, the implementation of precision medicine into daily care and as you know, endotype driven treatment, prevention, participation of the patient and all the innovation that is currently promoted by ERS, by Euphoria and by other stakeholders uh, involving the European patient organization is important. I did want to just briefly mention on how we also empower patients and how we make a patient an active partner in the participation of treatment plans for uh, sinusitis. You may know uh, my sinusitis coach as 
according to our opinion, a promising tool for better outcomes in uh, rhinosinusitis care. But what is important is that uh, with the Euphoria team and the support of many people, uh, several key rhinologists in Europe, we defined uh, the disease journey and provide patients with relevant questions, uh, the good answers to their questions. There is a pool of 110 questions that were most frequently asked by the patients. Patients get information about the most frequently asked questions also through videos, through educational videos. And uh, we will add soon also patient testimonials where patients can recognize their disease and how much burden it's not only causing to them, but also to uh, other uh, rhinosinusitis patients. These patient testimonials on the impact of disease, of impact of the uh, CRS on the quality of life, on work, uh, what to expect from surgery, what not to expect from surgery, why better treatment is needed. So we uh, collaborate with the patient in order to make sure that novel treatments will become available because if we talk to health policy makers it's not so efficient as health, uh, health policy makers that are convinced of the need of new treatment options by patients themselves. And also what are the patient needs uh, both at the level of education as well as at the level of treatment is highly promoted through these patient uh, testimonials. We are also building now or launching uh, on very short notice a patient advisory board that will help us uh, to go further on this path of advocacy for better and more um, uh, better outcomes in chronic rhinosinusitis care. Having said that, uh, I mentioned already this morning that all of this can only be uh, achieved if we implement the patient also in the way to get them to a timely access to treatment because also in our survey that is included in the MySinusitis coach, we find out that the mean duration between disease development and proper treatment is three years. So which is the time frame that is really not allowing proper and highly effective treatment. And this treatment could be medical treatment as well as surgical treatment because we know from the study of Claire Hopkins and other studies that uh, timely treatment is key for uh, efficacy of the treatment. And uh, my sinusitis coach allows monitoring of disease, uh, which allows us to evaluate uh, the impact of clear monitoring, better patient uh, participation, and better education of our patients, ultimately leading to better control. So I hope I have convinced you about the need for advocacy, why we do it, because quite often the outcomes cannot be really well defined, but I do think uh, that it's mandatory that also from the upper respiratory uh, field, uh, people are interested into this, uh, that we have active support also from the European Rhinologic Society, who is deeply involved in uh, the advocacy activities that have been ongoing uh, over the past four years, and I thank you for your attention.